I have Harry Decker as my guest. I lived in Arizona for four years. About five years ago, when I started becoming educated about the issue of climate change, what we are not being told, I started listening to Tony Heller and uh, lots of other lectures. And then, wait a minute here, yeah. And then I started to write to an email local news agencies. No response, you know. Say, hey, you people aren't telling us the truth. You need to interview these other scientists that tell you the other side of the story. They won't do it. And then PBS even came along. I used to watch Christiana M. 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 Poor out of London. I loved her show, you know. Then she got in the climate change bag, like, saying, oh, climate change is going to destroy the world, you know. And I, I said, and I said, I sent them numerous emails to her and PBS saying, hey, you need to interview these other scientists. I said, and give the, you're not supposed to be biased. You're supposed to let people talk on both sides of an issue, but PBS has even gotten corrupt in, in that respect. Although they still put out some good programs, they really do. But on that particular program, they're not letting the other side talk. Just about everybody, even college professors. Oh, here Arizona's running out of water. <laughs> I said, I can't believe how many people have told me that so far. And, and I sit down and say, listen, you're not being told the whole story. This has everything to do with this climate change issue, you know, regarding the state of Arizona. So I'm going to read to you what you're not being told and the people of Arizona are not being told, which is why I'm thinking if all the people here in this little town in Pennsylvania think Arizona's out of water, that means everybody in the United States thinks Arizona is running out of water. So here's what you're not being told. There are over 500,000 residential swimming pools in Arizona. There are many public swimming pools and large water parks. There are 200 golf courses in Phoenix metropolitan area alone. I'm going to use PMA for Phoenix metropolitan area. And because of the weather, they're open pretty much 365 days a year, and they get water just about every day. The Phoenix metropolitan area occupies over 14,500 square miles, 9 million square acres. Uh, all cities in the PMA maintain public parks. Many have private man-made lakes. Some of these lakes are stocked with fish. Fountain Hills has a gigantic man-made lake with a giant fountain in the middle. And it sprays water up like every hour, like 500 feet in the air. All cities in the PMA uh, maintain uh, several million square acres of trees and plants and flowers and parks. Many of these trees and plants are not native to Arizona. They plant them alongside roadways for beautification. They plant them in road dividers. Uh, and all these plants and trees require watering. Then you got millions of residents plant and maintain a few million acres of trees and plants and flowers not native to America that need water. They are starting to restrict it more now, though, in various cities and, re and tell people they must plant desert landscaping, which requires much, much less water. Here's the other thing. Is you don't know this until you start driving around and then, Many upscale residential areas have private man-made lakes with boat docks and boats, waterfalls and canals. Population of uh, the PMA is 5 million and growing. Consequently, you got more people, you need more water. Building is occurring everywhere. I first went out as a young teen to Phoenix in 1966. It was a town. People say I had chickens in their backyard <laughs> downtown. And, and all the cities at that time, Mesa, Tempe, Chandler, Glendale, were all divided by sectors of desert. Now it's grown into a giant metropolis like Los Angeles. They built new freeways, hundreds of millions of tons of concrete to build these highways and the bridges. Residential, apartments, businesses, downtown, dorm buildings. Arizona State University is building all of its campuses. They used to have a small campus in Tempe. Tony Heller went there. Tony Heller was at that ASU campus for a while. It used to be a small teacher's college. Now it's a gigantic campus. They have four campuses. They have the highest student enrollment of any university in the United States. They have like 350 degree programs. Very high tech oriented. I used to live downtown Phoenix. They got the uh, Walter Cronkite School of Journalism there. Sandra Day O'Connor uh, School of Law down there. One of the reasons I decided to leave Arizona it was getting more crowded, more expensive, and hotter in town because you got the urban heat item in effect. So I tried to become friends with this local meteorologist 
And I say, you need to talk about the early Hebrew heat island effect and just saying it's getting hotter because of climate change. But they don't talk about it, you know, but yeah, obviously that's going to uh, increase the temperature there. And all the high tech industries uh, right now, they're in the process of building a $12 billion uh, semiconductor chip plant in North, Arizona, in North Phoenix. They have uh, defense industries there where they build Apache attack helicopters and other things. But yeah, high tech, military, very, uh, very big. Phoenix has leased a certain amount of desert acreage to Saudi Arabia. You have any idea? <laughs> no. To grow cotton. Now, why would they want to grow? Cotton, by the way, is one of the big uh, money makers. It has been in the, for hundreds of years in, in, uh, in Arizona. Farmers are not happy about this, that they're leasing land to Saudi Arabia to grow their cotton because apparently Saudi Arabia has used up their uh, own aquifers, underground aquifers to grow their own cotton. So now they're using Arizona. What they're doing is they're draining the underground aquifers in Arizona. And farmers are not happy about that, but somebody's got a deal. They're making money off Saudi Arabia. And the other thing they pointed out is that it takes a lot of water water is cotton and they said about 99% of that water is evaporated it doesn't go back in into the ground you know because it's so freaking hot and dry there you know just evaporates to the ground so that, yeah the day's going to come where they're going to lose all their underground water aquifer the other thing i was trying to get the meteorologists to talk about is the history of climate in arizona they don't talk about that so I said, if we go back in time, 10,000 years, the topography of Arizona was much greener. Remains of mammoths and mastodons have been earth and earth from central Arizona all the way down into Mexico. Uh, Native Americans in central Arizona built many canals and used the water to grow crops. Uh, the Hohokam, they were called the Hohokam. Uh, by the time the pioneers uh, came into uh, the central Arizona there, because of a severe drought like over 1,000 years ago, Oh, there was a severe drought in the Southwest all the way through California for many, many years. And they have proven this by looking at tree ring data. That drove the Native Americans out. So when the pioneers came in, they were shocked to see canals, but their head all filled in with sand. So all I had to do is just dig the sand out and then start the water rolling, rolling in to, to do agriculture. The other thing I wanted to point out too was uh, Arizona can has experienced 100 year floods. So this shocked the hell out of me. Uh, when I was in, I believe it was the spring of 1981, it rained for 30 days and 30 nights straight in that whole valley. Usually it rarely rains. I've seen it go there without rain for six months, which is bad because then the pollution in the air builds up. The entire valley flooded. People were getting around in rowboats, had to be rescued. Uh, there are places where there are dips and there are signs there that say, do not cross if flooded. People do, and you know what happens to them? They drown. <laughs> Even though the sign says, do not, because they don't realize that that water, rushing water is more powerful than they think it is. So anyway, I would point out that uh, they do have floods there, and one occurred in the 1890s It flooded the entire uh, city of Phoenix, because the Salt River runs through Phoenix and Tempe. Before the early 1900s, it was just a regular river. It wasn't dammed up yet. So for flood control, they decided to dam it up. So right now, there's like four or five dams now to dam up the Salt River, a Roosevelt Dam and all of that for flood control. And then, of course, they use it all later for electrical generation, you know. Uh, but despite those dams, when I was there and it, it rained, that Salt River turned into a raging torrent. And they happened to, at the time, be building a brand new bridge that connected Phoenix with Tempe across what was pretty much then this, what you would call the Salt River Trickle. <laughs> At that point, by the way, where they were building a bridge, what happened with this bridge they were building is that raging river came along and tore it out. You wouldn't expect to see something like that happen in Arizona. So they do get cyclic weather events. There are extreme weather events that can happen there. So anyway, these are the things I tell people when they say the Arizona is running out of water. <laughs> Because polit certain politicians and mainstream media, media doesn't explain certain things. They want people to believe that it's climate change causing droughts and extreme weather events, which you, I know, and Tony Heller and everybody else knows hogwash. I sent emails out about this to news media and things like that. I said, okay, if the climate is changing, we know that there are established climate zones.
you know. I got a picture of one here called the what they call the Koppen, Koppen climate classification. They got it divided into 12 climate zones, you know, uh, here, there, and everywhere. So I said, well, okay, if the climate's changing, show me on the map where it's changed. Show me that. Okay, if the ice caps are melting and the uh, sea coasts are rising, show me, give me a visual of an ocean where it has risen. Now, Tony Heller, he's got them on this one because he's got several pictures where he shows 100 years ago the coastline. It shows the coastline today, very little change. In fact, some of the coastlines look like the beach has gotten bigger instead of small. And again, you confront them with the data and they just ignore it. You know, it, it's just un, uncanny, uncanny. I wrote an essay called Humans versus Antarctica. I noticed that on the news media, they mostly talk about the Arctic and not too much about Antarctica. Once in a while, they talk about that, particularly if there's a glacier that breaks away. But the other thing that I find that news media don't talk about and the politicians don't talk about is uh, just basic facts, like what's the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, how much uh, nitrogen and oxygen, because uh, it's mostly nitrogen and then oxygen and then argon and then trace gases, which carbon dioxide, what, 400? Did you see that video where a uh, congressman was quizzing s some people that are pushing uh, the green agenda and he, he was asking them how much carbon dioxide is I, in the atmosphere? Is that the other one? I saw oh, it. 5%, 8%, you know? No, it's more hundreds of 1%. And they don't know that. And they're trying to push a green agenda on. Man, I'll tell you, if I had the power, I'd fire them. You're out of here. I don't, I don't know about, uh, uh, well, one thing I learned about being coming a computer programmer when I was an, and technical writer when I was in the uh, service and I worked for other corporations as well is you can't make mistakes. No. The programmers have a expression for that. In the, in the military, we call it G.I. Joe. G I G O, we pronounce it's called garbage in, garbage out. You've heard that, yes. you know, mm -hmm. garbage in, yeah. And one thing that <laughs> you do is that you uh, you can't make mistakes. You you got to test test your program. You got to verify the data, you know, uh, because at times, you know, like I worked for St. Joseph's Hospital one time. You, uh, there are certain programs there. If you make a mistake on, it, people are going to die because of medical treatment was wrong. We go by the data, and uh, for some reason, people ignore the data. You can't ignore the data. So anyway, I came up with a thing, an essay called Humans versus Antarctica, and I thought, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, first of all, I, I checked, this, I wanted to see uh, how big Antarctica was. It's actually one and a half times the size of the United States. And I said, ah, that's pretty big, you know. I found out that in uh, certain places, the ice is three miles sick, thick. They have like 57 temperature weather stations across there. It's so huge. All of them record below temperature, below zero temperatures year round. There's one that gets up a little bit above uh, freezing for a short period of time. And by the way, where that where that is is there is a a uh, an active volcano, and there's a uh, volcanic. It's called Deception Island area. And there's people that tourists like to go there because there are hot springs there. Hot springs in Antarctica. <laughs> That's because there's volcano and heck, the volcano crossing that. And then the other thing I found out about Antarctica they don't talk about is I come to find out that there's uh, the largest cluster of volcanoes is in Antarctica, 138 of them above and below. Uh, there's a, there's one beneath the, uh, beneath the uh, Pine Island Glacier, which is a gigantic glacier, and it's active, so it's causing the glacier. They don't talk about that. They don't talk about the volcanic activity there, you know. Very harsh place to live. They got the uh, winds can be up to 200 miles an hour. Can you imagine being outside where it's like 60 degrees below zero with 200 mile an hour wind? It's, it's no wonder the explorers have died there. So uh, what I did was I thought, hmm, I looked up, I wanted to look up to see how many machines there are worldwide that burn fossil fuels. The point is, is that there's logging equipment, chainsaws, uh, log loaders, logging trucks, uh, these, and all of uh, these mining and logging 
people have to be able to get out into the boondocks to do their work. There's a lot of times there's no roads, you know? Uh, and of course you got your lawn uh, and field maintenance. The reason why I point this out to people is that, do you really expect solar energy and windmill energy to power all of these, this equipment, you know? This is equipment that uh, came out of the industrial revolution, established modern society, and it's gonna maintain modern society. There's no way you're gonna put a solar panel on top of a tank or a bulldozer <laughs> have it powered, you know? I, I don't, honest to God, Tom, I don't know what people are thinking. It's like, I think what the politicians and the news media do is they want people's focus to remain narrow on just what they're saying, you know? Not look at the big picture. Oh, don't look at the big picture, you know? It's like the man, uh, the man behind the curtain. Oh, don't, don't look at me, look at that. <laughs> And uh, I just can't. So the other thing I decided to do was, okay, let's count up how many of these are. And I counted up, if you had all these devices, small, large, uh, it comes to about a hundred billion, you know, how many there are. And of course there are 8 billion people in the world. So if you stood people shoulder to shoulder, how much space would 8 billion people take up? You put them shoulder to shoulder. In Los Angeles, it happens to be 500 square miles. They would fit in Los Angeles. And now it's like, oh, that's interesting. So I, I calculated all square footage that all these boats and tanks and um, bulldozers would take up. Um, and, and you put them on Antarctica. And it comes to about 3% of the land mass of Antarctica. So I thought to myself, this can't be right. Uh, something got to be wrong with it. That doesn't sound right. So what it did, I, I actually wrote this a year ago. What I have done since then, Tom, is I, I have approached university professors, high school teachers, math students. Would you please review this essay, what it's like? Four pages long. I said, check my math. Would you please check my math? I told the students, I said, I'll pay you. I'll pay you to check my math. You know, people, how many people got back with me? Zero. Nada. It's like, I don't want you to do is check my math, you know? I, I said, you know, so I'm hoping somebody will check my math on this to see, you know, if, I, uh, if I'm off somewhere. They made carbon dioxide out to be something evil. And I think I told you, and I tell other people, if you go back 50 to 100 years and you've asked people to define climate change, you're going to get a different answer than now because people are so brainwashed now. And I said, if you tell people 50 to 100 years ago that carbon dioxide is going to be evil, and then we have to ban it. Ban it. You know what people, how people would have reacted? They would say, you're nuts. They'd be right. You're out of your mind. <laughs> no, it gets, uh, apparently, brainwashing really does apparently effectively work on a massive scale. It's, it's hard to believe that. I had to research this myself. Well, what, what are good uses of carbon dioxide? And the main thing is, is that carbonated beverages... Soda, beer, wine, champagne, club soda. I said, do you realize how much of that is used worldwide on a daily basis? And this, this is carbon dioxide that's manufactured, that's put into uh, drinks, unless of course it occurs naturally like in beer fermentation and wine fermentation, you know. But every time you drink a pop or a beer or whatever, you're releasing carbon dioxide. This is going on in every city, town, village in the United in, in the world every day of the year. And I'm thinking, well, interesting. Why don't they have, since the carbon dioxide is so evil, why don't they have a campaign to ban carbonated beverages? Right. Now, how do you think people would react about that, Tom? I think it's a good idea. <laughs> but how would they react? They wouldn't like it. No. no. No, it makes it a little more personal, doesn't it? Oh, really? You know? And uh, the other thing I found out, too, I do b believe that pollution actually is a problem. You know, it is a problem. And then and people are so stupid, just throw things away, you know, idiots. Uh, and then only about 20% of plastics are, are recycled. But I found out that if you take all the containers uh, they use to make soda pop, whether it's in cans or bottles, in beer and uh, wine, all these things have to have containers. It comes to about a trillion 
containers annually. You know, I'm thinking, why aren't they talking about that? And all the good things that uh, carbon dioxide is for, here's a few others, uh, freeze food products. Uh, they chill meats prior to grinding for re refrigeration or transportation of food products to market. Oh, here's some, they, they use it to recover oil from oil wells. They pump it down in and uh, they treat it, treatment for alkaline water. They have used it to freeze COVID vaccines. Use, they use it for methanol and urea production in the chemical process industry. They use it for circuit board assembly to clean surfaces. Uh, they use it in fire extinguishing systems, solid and liquid form. Used in many, many various chemicals, it did, it's added to oxygen for medical use as a respiration stimulant. It's a good solvent for many organic compounds. It's used in propellant and aerosol cans. They use it to create plastics and polymers, to display air during canning food processes. I guess that's to keep germs out or something. <laughs> I don't know how they do this, but they use it to decaffeinate coffee. <laughs> how do they do that? <laughs> they use it in... Uh, Perfuming industry, they use it to remove paint with dry ice pellets from surfaces as opposed to using sandblasting. Because it was sandblasting, I guess it makes a mess, you know. Uh, they use it to manufacture casting molds to inflate life rats and life jackets. A plastic agent in mining, they use it to produce feedstock. And they also use it to immobilize animals in a humane manner before they are slaughtered. Whatever now they do that, I don't know. Oh yeah, they use uh, dry ice in movies and music videos and magic shows to give you that foggy look, you know. So anyway, if you want to ban carbon dioxide, there you go. They already, they pump, pump it into greenhouses. Greenhouse, uh, what's, what's about 400 parts per million, but they pump it up from uh, 1,000 to 1,500 parts per million in greenhouses to make the plants grow faster and have higher crop yield. So imagine cutting that out. How do they make carbon dioxide? Uh, the most common way of producing carbon dioxide is with capturing it from a, with the production of ammonia, around 80% of which is used as a plant fertilizer in the farming industry. Uh, it's also used by burning natural gas to separate the carbon and hydrogen atoms. It gripes me that the United Nations and Congress will listen to a 15-year-old emotional girl, but they won't listen to scientists. You know, it's like, what? Insane. Yes. So anyway, I come across this picture. There's Greta, and there's a German girl. Looks almost exactly like her. She's carrying a can with a Nazi swastika on it, collecting money for the Nazi youth organization. <laughs> <laughs> in the 1940s yeah, for, for the Nazi youth. They had the uh, Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls, you know, and I thought, I said, look at, look at the similarity between them. And that's exactly what's happening with Greta is that she's just being used for propaganda purposes and people buy into that. And I, I don't know why people can't see through that, but it's it, apparently it's the, emo it's the emotional appeal, you know. Yeah. She comes across as very serious, you know, I, I do kind of man, uh, admire her for taking a stand, you know, but there's another young lady too that I admire for taking a stand called Naomi Zeit. You know Naomi, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. She didn't get near the uh, publicity that, that Greta got, and then she got ridiculed a lot, and I guess her, her internet shut, site got shut down because right. not only was she criticizing climate change, she, she was criticizing uh, COVID vaccines as well. She's college educated, a lot smarter than Greta is, oh, you yeah. know, but no, they'd rather listen to Greta. Again, uh, we got climate change. They're claiming that might kill people in decades to come. And most of the people making this claim are going to be dead by the year 2050 or 2100. They're making these claims. Uh, oh, something that popped my head back in 1997 in Arizona. You may have heard of this guy. Harold Camping was predicting the end of the yeah. world. Mm -hmm. I've heard of him. He put billboards along roadways. I used to drive past it this billboard every day, you know, and, and in other parts of the country saying in October or something such in 1997, the world's going to come to an end, you know, because the Bible said so, you know, of course it didn't happen. <laughs> and, and many, many other predictions have been made this uh, made like this in the past. And then as a result of that, uh, many of his followers left him and his, his ministry went, went down the tubes. But, uh, along that line, you got all these people, Al Gore being the prime suspect, making all these predictions city new york city is going to flood you know his predictions haven't come true 
But the problem is, is people are still listening to him. They won't listen to a, a religious person that makes a bad prediction, but they're, they'll listen to these politicians. I don't get it. As you know, the climate alarmists has been accused of being basically a religious movement. Now, you try to talk people out of their religion. <laughs> no, yeah. no, the climate change to me is just like a smokescreen. Uh, for what's going on. Yeah, what else is there? Woke movement, transgender issues, genetically modified foods, the great Pacific garbage patch, Donald Trump, the royal family. It never ends on things they, that aren't really that important. That's all I got for you, Tom. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. And I'll talk to you next time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Right. See you. Goodbye.